Is this thing on? Um, it is. Um, let's see if the projection is you. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, as uh, customary uh, to my speeches and keynote, this will be a crowdsourced speech. Um, for those of you who have cell phones or any other devices that can connect to this great thing called the internet, uh, please go to this website, uh, which is slido.com. Once you're on slido.com, you can enter this event code without the pound sign, uh, 01017 today's date. And once you're in, uh, this is a anonymous chat room. Uh, the chat room basically enables anyone to ask me anything uh, during the keynote and also like each other's questions. And I'm committed to answer every single one of the questions, but if there's just too many, then I will just answer the ones that are of the higher score. So if you click like, the ones with the more like appears on the top, and which I will highlight and um, answer. So while you're still, you know, maybe thinking about what question to ask, let me give you a very brief presentation, about five minutes long, about uh, our approach uh, on this thing called um, misinformation, disinformation, and other cracks huh, to our democratic governance system in the age of the social web. Um, there's a uh, famous line in a uh, poet in a singer, uh, Leona Cohen, that I very much like. Uh, it goes like this, quote, there is a crack in everything, and that is how the light gets in, unquote. And here we're facing a crack in our democracy through disinformation and through misinformation and a different kind of uh, way of undermine trust in our democratic institutions. But that also gives us a chance for the light to shine through and for global cooperation. Because mis misinformation, you see, is a old phenomenon, but it gains a new um, playground in the age of social media, where it is easier to share a piece of information than actually reading through it, where it's easier to actually make a meme go viral before um, anyone has the chance of commenting on it. So it is a very different um, age and very different um, atmosphere compared to paper-based media, where you literally have to finish reading the pro and cons, the different sides of a report, before actually sharing that piece of paper. So it is the screen-based reading really calls for a very different way of balancing information. And this targets, of course, not only the trust on democratic institutions or the government, but rather it undermines the trust of everybody to everybody. Um, the fake accounts, the various other ways that hostile actors have been able to use the social media and other online venues undermines the trust that people appearing as someone else and people with deep fakes um, <laughs> appearing as someone else in uh, very uh, different ways uh, compared to our face-to-face -face conversation and face-to-face -face notes. And within all this, um, Taiwan upholds the freedom of speech as our core value, because um, I still remember the days in the martial law. We only gained uh, true election and freedom of information and assembly and so on for one generation. So we still remember how it's like to be without those freedoms, and we are committed to keep those freedoms alive. And so we're kind of um, forced to innovate, to face this um, misinformation campaigns and disinformation threats with ways that does not um, destroy the freedom of information or freedom of speech, because that is exactly what those actors want from us. So um, we, we basically, our uh, approach is proactive instead of reactive. Instead of waiting for misinformation to spread, we give a timely response whenever there's misinformation about anyone. Um, take a personal example, two years ago, just uh, when people learned that I'm going to become the digital minister, there was a large parade uh, on the street, and there's a misinformation that spreads that says uh, Audrey Tang is able to monitor everybody's whereabouts using GPS satellites and mind control. Um, this <laughs> Obviously, it's not true, but it, it gives a um, symptom of the underlying distrust of people and location tracking and other um, legit suspicions about technologies. And so I took that chance to record um, a live video and also write numerously online and responding in real time in social media, basically proactively sharing what kind of digital governance am I envisioning? What do I actually mean by radical transparency? How people can actually find me in my office 
this hour in the Social Innovation Lab every Wednesday and talk to me face to face and also publish our interactions online. So that gives me a perfect chance to outline the kind of radical transparency and radical trust that I wish to uh, instill in my um, office. And so um, by responding proactively, I think this makes it less likely for misinformation to grow into disinformation. If on the other hand, um, based on those rumors, based on those speculations which are perfectly valid in a democratic society, um, the, go the government, the institutions has remained silent, then after a period of silence, it creates the perfect opportunity of hostile actors who want to sow this court through intentional disinformation campaigns. And that creates the real problem because then it creates a fertile ground for those fires of the mind to spread and to harm people's trust on each other. And of course, uh, during election season, which is very close now, uh, we also see people who even are willing to risk criminal offense to interfere in election and to intimidate the, the public. Of course, we have legal code um, to enforce uh, all those rule of law when people commit criminal offense. But as people have already pointed out, uh, how to automatically enforce these and how to expose those criminal offenses to the public, that is something that we can brainstorm and we can innovate on. So to very briefly recap, um, the perfectly valid and normal uh, thing of rumors and sometimes misinformation, uh, we work actively in a way that includes everybody in decision making. Um, for all the people who complain, for example, about our tax filing system last year, instead of you know just uh, responding to those accusations, we invited everyone who complained a free pass to the co-creation workshop to make this year's tax filing report and uh, system. And I think this is the perfect example because anyone who participates actually understands how is it like to be in the kitchen of policy making and rule making, and people are armed with an extra contextual information that they can act ex vaccines of the mind so that whenever they hear something that is just partially true or manifestly untrue about the tax filing system, they are able to spread the truth and to participate in co-creation. And this, in turn, enhances accountable and transparent institutions. Um, these are all sustainable development goals targets. They make wonderful icons. Um, and uh, for this information, and that is to say intentional spreading of discord, uh, we work partner with the independent fact-checking mechanisms, both abroad and also domestic. Uh, we work, uh, as the um, introducer has mentioned, I work in the K-12 curriculum, and we're one of the first, if not the first, uh, place in Asia to introduce in our K-12 basic curriculum the ability to critically think and the capacity for the teachers to learn along with students on navigating various information online. And so media literacy is one of the nine core characters or literacies in our new curriculum. And with that, I think a new generation that does not believe anything just because it's printed or said in some way, in an authoritative way, but actually learns to navigate the various different layers of message setting and can contribute substantially to the civil society originated um, fact-checking efforts. And finally, we need to provide psychological safety online. So people um, can rest assured that if there are actors who intimidate the public or commit other criminal offenses, that the government will respond in a timely fashion to expose the actual intent and the degree. And if these are rumors or um, disinformation that we cannot um, explain because it occurs in an end-to-end encrypted chat channel or whatever, we trust uh, our civil society partners to develop automatic bots and other uh, new technological inventions that surfaces those dark rumors uh, into the public where we can then tell whether it is just misinformation, people who are misinformed, which we then resolve just by proactively opening up our decision-making process. Or there are really hostile actors behind it that are working in a way that is concerted, in which we develop vaccines of the mind, such as media literacy programs and fact-checking programs. And finally, if people are willing to commit um, criminal offense mostly to interfere in the election, then of course, timely judgment from the judicial process. And so, finally, all, none of this, of course, can be done domestically. I am not even sure domestically even make any sense at this point now because everything is widespread, everything is global, uh, including the threats and the innovations to um, counter those threats. And so, 
using the, this, again, a very nice icon from Sustainable Development Goals, we need to encourage effective partnerships. And so that is my introduction, and let's see what you have uh, to ask. So feel free to, oh, that's great. We have 10 questions and um, half an hour. Feel free to just add to it. Uh, the new posted uh, questions will appear in the uh, bottom as uh, the latest question. So Jess Macy Yu uh, would like to know, how does Taiwan know that fake news that is traced to China is also linked to the Chinese government? This is a great question. Um, not all IP addresses that tra traces back uh, to any provincial or domestic origin is necessarily linked to the government, right? It can also be linked to the party or to the military. Um, but <laughs> I mean, um, there, there is, there is no, no clear um, indication that, of course, one of those three actors. But we can, of course, um, make what we know public and rely on independent and investigative journalists to complete the puzzle. So instead of indicating any particular government branch or military or party, uh, what we actually do is we share with um, the independent journalists what we have on um, our hands, what facts, what evidences, what data we have, and the limits of which we also disclose. And we rely on an international collaboration framework to piece together those puzzle pieces to give them a much more complete picture than we can obtain on our own. But we're totally committed to share our part of the evidence and the data that we have gathered. Um, Maybe you would like me to uh, share my hobby, which is troll hugging. Uh, this is completely unexpected, but I will answer it anyway. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, my hobby is troll hugging. Um, I shared uh, this hobby about 10 years ago in a blog post. Uh, trolls, as you know, are people who just post misinformation and sometimes very toxic ones uh, online in order to gain attention. Uh, trolls are not always state-sponsored or even organized. Mostly, they were just people who crave for attention because they don't give uh, each other sufficient hugs, I guess, in the real world. So they really want attention uh, from a uh, monitor for some reason. Uh, and the trolls uh, usually uh, make maybe 100 words of ad hominem attacks, uh, sometimes um, you know, transphobic or sometimes uh, like always personal toward me. Uh, and uh, I've seen uh, a lot of those trolling posts that's directly to, uh, to me personally. And so um, the troll hugging is a two-step um, movement. The first step is that if I see any word, any word at all, that makes me upset, that um, you know, reaches me through the visual field that makes me feel upset, then I uh, make some other uh, field in other sensory stimuli like uh, make uh, good music or to have a fine uh, tea or something that smells good uh, and basically reassociate this visual word stimuli with something that is pleasant, uh, that is coming from uh, listening or from smelling or from eating. Uh, so uh, that creates a new association in my brain so that the next time that I see those toxic words, I actually feel really good. And instead of, <laughs> instead of being upset, which is exactly what the troll wants, right? And then I engage uh, with the troll if and only if I can see maybe three words, maybe five words of the 100 word post that are authentic, that reveal something of the troll themselves, that reveal something that's substantial, that is of public interest. And I reply with a very calm mind, very carefully to those three or five words. So this creates two facts. First, that it tells the troll that they can only get attention that they crave if they contribute something to the public forum, the public discussion. And second, it tells all the bystanders that it is actually okay to reveal authentically part of one's experiences, maybe negative experiences, because you know personal feelings, there's no right or wrong. It's okay to reveal those feelings. And I do that um, as part of my responses. Sometimes I just re record a short video clip. Um, and so after that, the trolls learn gradually to reveal more and more of themselves because they understand now the attention that they're getting this way from the community and also from me is relational in nature. Previously, the troll only gets transactional uh, attention. So they wake up 
and because the attention they got was transactional, they have to find somewhere else to troll and get a fresh batch of like junk food, right? Because it's not really healthy to one's mind to have a series of transactional relationships. Well, it's not even relational reactions from anonymous people to anonymous people. So they learned that there are some stable relationships that's possible online. And most um, importantly, I have this um, office hour in the social innovation lab. So I actually, after a few rounds of exchange, welcome the troll to my office hour every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. in the social innovation lab, which is like this. And sometimes they see self-driving tricycles uh, driving around. This is a very interesting uh, place of co-creation. And I physically give them a hug as well. And so, <laughs> So this is, this is troll hugging, and um, it, it would not be possible without the first uh, a kind of cognitive behavior therapy on one's own mind, but after uh, that movement, after that initial making room in one's mind, uh, we can take a humorous and even lighthearted sound on one of the you know, most um, difficult uh, challenges in our world, which is it's very easy to project whatever people want to project into a piece of words or a, a bit of image that's taken out of context. But after getting people in the habit of if they reveal something authentic that contribute to public discourse, they always get something authentic from the minister and it's welcome to face-to-face -to -face conversations to give a hug and things like that. I think people generally feel much better and can be more active contributors to democracy. <coughs> Um, Dr. Gavin Ellis from New Zealand would like to know what research is being undertaken in Taiwan to detect and thereby counter deep fakes and other AI generated forms of fake news. This is a hot machine learning topic. Uh, and so um, I I'm sure that people will eventually uh, see COVAX uh, during the workshop, but I would just like to highlight uh, their work. Uh, this is a civil society um, bot that is um, in an end-to-end -end encrypted um, channel called LINE that is very popular here. It's like WhatsApp. And I assure you that this is not gender biased. If you refresh, um, you just switch to a different pronoun. Um, anyway, so in any case, uh, the idea very simply put is that if you add this bot as your friend on instant messaging, whenever you see a piece of deep fake or shallow fake, you can always share to this bot, which is literally called, is it true or not? So it gives a good um, instant response that doesn't cost anything uh, from one's uh, psychology. If you see something that you suspect is disinformation, um, to fact check it, of course, it uh, takes far more time. But it's very easy to just instinctively reply publicly, oh, is it true or not? Gender data. And then it gets everybody into this like turn-based game instead of real-time strategy um, peace of mind. <laughs> and that people can actually look at it collectively and uh, see what is trending in those. Um, and they're all replied, meaning that the civil society is working very quickly. <laughs> uh, and but, but you can see all the trending uh, disinformation campaigns and rumors, both, uh, on the instant messages. And this literally shines a light on those uh, dark uh, places where it's impossible for search engines or other analysis to go through because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. But just by getting people the habit of reporting new streams of virus of the mind, here, yeah, um, as we can see, this is uh, almost always about elections now. Uh, but still, there's something about food, there's something about diplomacy. Any election, those three seems to be the theme here, but we're not sharing it for too long, lest it pollutes everybody's mind. But we can also see that the crowdsourced um, investigators are very quickly um, clarifying the messages. And the great thing is that there's some also great innovations like, um, you know, maintaining uh, glucose levels uh, by this new innovation uh, by the ITRI, uh, by our Institute of uh, Research, but it seems too good to be true. So people respond uh, saying maybe this is a rumor uh, that tries to boost ITRI's uh, research uh, prowess, but uh, then people start fact-checking and discover this is actually true, this is a breakthrough in medicine, and then uh, people are able to classify this as um, truth, and also we learn something about if you package truth in this way, it actually goes viral. Again, this goes into the, if you shine a light on um, a conversation that's 
that's going in the underground, you can review not only the falsehood, but also the truth that is worth sharing. And so um, I encourage people who are interested in using machine learning, there's a lot of machine learning experts in the COFAX community to engage with the local COFAX community, and as well as other communities working on this topic, because, because this is a highly interesting topic. As far as I know, they're also working on porting this to WhatsApp and other forms of instant messaging. Um, then we as would like to know what are the channels by which the PRC spreads this information through Taiwan's society? Well, um, there's many, like if there's any channel that you can think of, it's probably already used for that purpose. <laughs> but then um, any channel that can spread information is a channel that can spread this information. As I uh, mentioned in my uh, main talk, this information uh, springs out of uh, an environment where there's already um, distrust. There was, there's already a uh, discord in the civil society so that people are more willing to believe those conspiracy theories. Um, so if we work in a misinformation layer, if we see those well-intentioned speculations and just occasional individual trolls and treat them um, seriously, authentically, then in that particular channel, people become vaccinated against future disinformation campaigns. And so far, that is the most effective way that we've um, discovered. It is just through deliberation. It could be an online AI-moderated conversation that asks people what they feel about any particular thing. I'm going to sh uh, share an example. Um, so this is uh, the AI powered conversation system POTUS that we have deployed uh, since 2015. At that time, the first was to talk about this thing called sharing economy, which means very different things to many different people. And so people just look at one particular example, which is a uh, Uber's use of people without professional driver's license. And we just ask people one simple question, what do you feel about it? Uh, and then people share their feelings and see their feelings among the different uh, groups of people who are their Facebook or Twitter friends. But we always start with a crowdsourced fact evidence gathering campaign where people contribute to not just open data but also uh, independent reports and things like that that gives people a timeline and the basic facts on which to discuss. And then after that we ask for people's feelings. And once people share their feelings, they get this into this state of mind, what we call a overview effect, where they can see everybody's feelings, not just their own personal feelings. And then we start to ideate. The best ideas are the ones that address the most people's feelings. And so user experience-wise, it's very simple. You log in, or you can remain anonymous, and then you see an avatar representing you, and then you see one uh, feeling from uh, a fellow citizen, and then you can click agree or disagree. And as you click agree or disagree, your avatar will move among the clusters of people that you know um, or you don't know, and you learn where you stand, where your feelings resonate with the most number of people. But in this space, there's two um, advantages. The first one is that there is no reply button. So the troll has no place to troll. It is impossible to uh, reply to each other's feelings. You can only contribute your own feelings. And the second thing is that it shows that people's feelings can change when people propose something that is resonating with everybody. And so in a place that is safe, it's impossible to troll. And also, <clears throat> it is strictly additive. People can only add to the feelings that resonate. We see something that is very different from traditional social media. People would agree to disagree on a few key things, usually ideological things, but they spend far more time on um, proposing consensus statement that they wish to um, compose and in a nuanced, eclectic way and convince people in different groups because we uh, share the agenda setting process. This is like a more complex version of Slido that you're just using. You can add to Slido, but you cannot reply to each other's questions. You can upvote, and I commit myself of answering to the ones that has more resonance with people, meaning more people want to hear the answer to that question. So through this uh, visualization, we know time again and again, and we work with, like this is the Bowling Green uh, consultation, work with international communities to perfect this kind of feeling gathering, feeling checking, uh, AI powered conversation, so that by the end of it, people understand people have legitimate, different, authentic feelings, and in this kind of uh, place of mind, it's impossible for this information to claim people's attention because people have already have a whole picture, contextual understanding of what 
uh, information there is, and most importantly, what the society feels collectively about this. And in that kind of situation, there's no way for disinformation to spread. So again, active participation in a stage where things are just rumors and misinformation is key from uh, to prevent disinformation to spread. Um, an anonymous person would like to ask, how do we ensure the credibility of fact checkers? This is a great question. Um, usually, if they review how they do the fact checking, if you can do fact checking on their method of fact checking, if there is an accountability trail that they can account for the kind of work that they do, this is uh, how we um, ensure that people can um, always check the fact checkers. So the Taiwan Fact Checking Center, um, which publishes reports, The people who work harder are most likely to get that for some reason, uh, right? And it's partially true. <laughs> and and they uh, revealed um, exactly what are the main contentious points, which literatures um, the fact checkers have um, consulted, uh, what kind of uh, correlations instead of causations are there uh, implied in the papers, uh, and basically. Um, it says if it's only if you work during uh, dinner and if work distracts you from dinner and that there's maybe a, co a, a causal relationship, but otherwise uh, the, the um, misleading or oversimplified title is actually partially wrong. And, and so, of course, everybody can see the research methods, the fact-checking method that the fact-checkers have used to clarify this message, and it contributes to the public discourse. So, of course, you can replicate their steps, but also uh, supply more materials and more evidences to this uh, fact-checking process. So at the end, I think everybody can participate in the fact-checking. They're not just consumers of reports of fact-checking, but it enables in a kind of a standard operation procedure kind of way what, how to approach a piece of news and how to approach a piece of information. Four people would like to know how is misinformation defined and what's the difference be between misinformation and different perspectives. So misinformation, uh, to me personally, is unintentional certainly not organized um, speculation or a piece of information that may contain controversies or disputes or that are just partial truth. And in uh, Mandarin here, we use the term zheng yi xun xi, which means uh, literally controversial information. And this is the most neutral term that we can use because we understand that it's like a puzzle Everybody has an incomplete piece. To everybody else, it looks like misinformation because everybody has a different slice of truth uh, from their perspective. But the important thing is that we see misinformation as an invitation for people to complete the picture together, to gather the evidence and the feelings together. And so this does not carry the uh, connotation that people who are different from, say, the government's or the minister's pers perspective are misinformation. I can also hold many um, information that are outdated, that my browser cache really need to be refreshed, and things like that. It is uh, outdated beliefs and outdated facts are actually by itself misinformation, but not through malice and certainly not through organized um, action to sow discord. And so this uh, moniker, translated as Zheng Yi Xunxi, reminds us to be humble to people of different perspectives and always see that as invitation of a real and true public conversation. Just would like to know which platforms uh, are the most dangerous distribution channels of the F word that I don't use in Taiwan. Um, I think um, this is um, a great question. Dangerous to, to whom, though? Um, we, we see PTT, for example, being a mostly text-only forum. This is like the equivalent of Reddit um, in Taiwan. It offers um, a very, I would say, very uh, good tradition of uh, moderators in forums, in, in the individual forums in the PDT, they have the right to self-moderate based on the contributions. They also run elections for their moderators and things like that. So it is very much a kind of autonomous <coughs> ruling um, public discussion forum that is free from um, any uh, for-profit motives. And so because of that, but precisely because of that, we see the most advanced um, 
disinformation campaigns and even criminal offenses first testing their waters on PDT because the um, entry barrier is the lowest and that people are often given the benefit of doubt if they're testing new bots or new artificial intelligence techniques on PDT. And so we see that it's where innovation happens, but it's also where the newest threat happens. It's like event boss uh, compared to Facebook and to Line. And Facebook usually um, serves as the amplifier of the techniques that's already discovered as useful on PTT, so it's a disseminator. Uh, and Line usually um, intentional disinformation campaigns that they know that they will not survive public scrutiny if it's posted on PTT or Facebook publicly, but they have to rely on end-to-end -end encryption. Anyway, -end encryption uh, don't get me wrong, it's a great thing, but because of end-to-end -end encryption, we need to um, do more innovations like the line bot and things like that to surface those disinformation trends into the public scrutiny. So it's dangerous in various different ways, but it's also exciting and innovating in different ways. Um, Six people would like me to elaborate more about the media literacy curriculum in K-12. What are the persons involved in planning the curriculum? That's a great question. So um, in the new curriculum that's going to take effect uh, next September, I believe, um, there's a very um, kind of paradigm shift um, of how we approach education. Previously, in our previous curriculum, which is part of the course in many East Asian countries, uh, we emphasize the importance of skills and perfecting the skills of various different disciplines. But in the new curriculum, the new educational target is characters or literacies. And so the characters of autonomy, of people's uh, ability to um, design their own curriculum, essentially, is the first thing that we want to cultivate. And second, interaction. And media literacy is part of the computational thinking and media literacy um, um, char character. And the third one is common good. That is to say, see people with different cultures and different ethnicities, different backgrounds, not as instruments, but as people, and uh, collaborate on shared values that are of, um, of use of everyone instead of using other people as means. And so these are the three fundamental characters we want to share with our new curriculum, and that calls for a very different kind of curriculum design. Instead of individual schools just executing what the Ministry of Education and the Curriculum Committee have designed for them, they are actually now co-creators with the parents, with the community, and the students. And so we have a new set of capstone projects, um, in especially senior high school level, where the students solve a social or environmental problem through, say, social entrepreneurship or any other contribution to the sustainable development as part of their learning. And they design the course with the local NGOs and nonprofits and social entrepreneurs, and that's the senior high level. And the senior high uh, students can choose the ones to their liking. So we bring the kind of college system, uh, the college uh, credit system to the um, senior high level. And to the uh, primary and the junior high level, we also encourage different schools to emphasize on different li literacy projects by, again, engaging the alternative schools, the experimentational schools, the local um, college universities, and so on, and use those different modes of education as resources and co-create across generational barriers and so that uh, the children learn to contribute to the society by those literacy campaigns and joining those volunteer efforts and maybe becoming a fact checker as part of the curriculum. And again, this is devolved to the individual schools uh, curriculum planning committee and not at all determined by the National um, uh, Academy of Education Research. But we switched our um, evaluation system, our examination system, to look at what kind of characters of collaboration that the students have born out of those capstone projects that they have finished or completed and how they see their own social their positive impact to the society after completing those courses. And so this is the kind of overview, but there's uh, much more to it. And if you're interested, uh, feel free to look at the NAER, the National Academy of Education Research, which we have a very complete material about the new curriculum and how we partner with our NGO uh, counterparts. Um, four people would like to know, how do we prevent influential politicians, heads of state and state actors from using this information to misguide their own people, like these people are seeing in the US? Um, well, first of all, I would like to say that um, 
sometimes people use Twitter the way Twitter is meant to be used. That is to say, a self-contained short message that people cannot misinterpret. And um, I actually admire this kind of use of Twitter. Uh, but that said, I understand also that people sometimes um, take those as cues and then spread far more malicious and trolling uh, information that may not be you know, intentional by the original um, state actors that's posted on Twitter. I mean, I post on Twitter all the time, and people partially quote me and make uh, various mess uh, out of those messages. And I think, um, so it is not about prevention. This is about uh, actively engaging. This is about asking more transparency and more accountability in the policy making process. Like for me, uh, for example, personally, I publish on my um, website, the public digital innovation space, all the raw transcript of all the even internal meetings, but also meetings with media and also with lobbyists in a complete uh, transcript kind of way. So this gives people what is it like to be in my day to day work and gives me um, a great way to respond to any online accusations or partially quoted information by essentially just linking to each word in every word, which all has its own permanent link. It also makes it very easy to be discovered by the search engine. And this is uh, a great piece of um, civic technology built out by the My Society folks in the UK uh, called Say It. And, uh, by personal experience, this really empowers independent journalism and investigative journalists because uh, by sharing the context of policy making, not just the end result of the policy itself, but the why and how of policy making, it empowers the independent investigative journalists to add their perspectives to the narrative and also in encourages people to look into the various different complexities during the policy making process instead of just relying on one press release because it's just a compressed version. In a tweet, I mean, it's just 140 um, Chinese characters or 280 English letters. Um, it is uh, insufficient room to give the total context. But in my Twitter post, I often just link back to the say it, which, uh, I mean, a URL is shortened, doesn't consume much letters, but people get into the context of seeing one very poetic provocation from me, but it is backed by a full conversational uh, context. So I would encourage other state actors to do the same. Um, so Jihao and four other people would like to know, um, is there a sharing and a part mechanism and partnership uh, established for um, the government, especially the administration, to share what we know about uh, those disinformation campaigns? Yes. So um, as many of you know, um, in our administration's uh, homepage, there is already a real-time clarification where all the different ministries respond, usually within five or six hours, uh, whenever there's either disinformation or just rumors, misinformation, or just difference in perspectives uh, or criminal offense. Uh, and um, they are actually really quick now, nowadays to re respond to it, so much so that when people see something on the morning news and wonder is this true or not, uh, people generally learn to wait until noon and then <laughs> there is a new batch of information shared by the central uh, administration. But we also hear from civil society and journalistic partners that this display confuses misinformation, disinformation, and criminal offense. Sometimes we publish something that the um, ministry uh, deem as intimidating the public and has some origination information that they share, and they actually brought up lawsuits and investigative processes, but then it leads us to think that all of it are here, uh, are, are like this, but it's not like that. <laughs> Only maybe uh, less than 10% are criminal offenses that uh, the administration shares. Most of it are actually just complementing each other's uh, information and preemptively revealing more context in, uh, in order to respond to would-be disinformation campaigns. And so um, we hear from the civil society and the journalists that they want more clearly coded um, maybe colors, maybe icons from those uh, clarifications. They want to know which one of these are criminal offenses, which are the disinformation campaign that we have some idea of, and which are just our conversation with the media and the civic, civic media. And it also makes it much more clear that it is, it, we're not targeting journalists. Uh, we're not offending journalists 
works this way if we're uh, sharing the sufficient contextual information and clearly marking it. And so in response to Jiha, we're now working uh, with the various departments and the administration to provide the right category and right coding of that bulletin board. But the revised uh, version and mechanism will still be on the same web page on that bulletin board. And so um, that's uh, all the questions I have uh, the time to answer because we're um, in 10 a.m. now. Uh, but feel free to look at each other's questions because those will inform the workshops. And uh, I wish you a great uh, training session and workshop. And let's uh, collaborate and bring the light into democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much to Minister Austin Kane. Thank you again for your inspiring presentation. Please take your seat. Please join me in giving another warm of applause to Minister Tang.